Hello everyone, bonjour, my name is Emmanuel Cesson. I'm the new harpist with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, former principal harp with the Metropolitan Opera and professor at the Manet School of Music in New York. And I would like to welcome you warmly to this special Harptacular with Lion and Healy. I really wish I could have been with you today in San Francisco to present a live recital in your presence. But unfortunately, due to the current COVID crisis, we had to play things safe and imagine this virtual event. So instead of giving you a one hour film recital, I decided to spice things up a little bit and record a video blog or vlog about one of my favorite harpists of the past century, the great Henriette Renier. I'm not gonna share her biography with you because you can find all of this online, but in short, she was one of the most prominent ambassador to our instrument in the past century. And she did that through her amazing virtuoso playing, of course, uh, her composing and many transcriptions, and finally, her lifetime dedication to many great students like Marcel Granjani, Mildred Dilling, Harpo Marx, and Suzanne MacDonald, amongst many others. So today, we are going to imagine a journey together through time and space, not to be taken too seriously, and we are going to try to focus on what I think are the four main sources of inspiration Henriette Renier uh, put in her music. The first one was her love for nature and the outdoors. The second one was her admiration for other composers who she honored through her many transcriptions. Number three is her taste for literature and the fantastic. And finally, number four, and it's binding all of the proceedings together, a very, very deep faith in God. So to do that, uh, I'm going to go through some of our really well-known works, like the Legend, but also a lot of rarities that people don't really know that she composed. We are also going to have a special guest who had the chance to study with Henriette Renier during the last years of her life. And finally, I all hope you are going to have some fun along the way. So without further ado, I give you a day with Henriette une journée avec Henriette. See you guys. Oh, the guy is still super early here in LA, and uh, I wonder how he's still asleep. So I guess the harp is still too dark. I read something. So I'm gonna hop in the shower and get ready for a nice hike up there. See you guys. So. As I told you in the introduction, I wanted to focus today about the different elements that have, I think, inspired Henriette Renier uh, to write her music. And one of these elements, which in my opinion is an important one, is nature. Uh, first of all, you may not know, but she was a, an avid uh, tennis player. She loved the outdoors. But not only that, I think one of the big reasons is that she had a family house in Etretat. So Etretat is on the north coast of France, in Normandy. It's a region which is famous for uh, its apple orchards, but uh, mostly for the D-Day, where the Allied force uh, arrived on the beaches of Normandy to end World War II. Etretat is also renowned uh, worldwide for its beautiful cliffs that overlook the English Channel. And apparently Henriette Renier's house was on top of one of those cliffs. That's according to our special guest today, the great Susan MacDonald, former professor at the Juilliard School and head of the harp department at the Bloomington Jacob Schools of Music in Indiana. Uh, 
she was kind enough to answer my questions over Skype a few weeks back. And so uh, let's hear a little story she has to share about Etreta. And for the second part of the summer, she and all of her students went to Etreta, where she had her lovely... Uh, a summer resort. house, basically. Oh, yes. Trois étages, grand étage. So, uh, and my chaperone went along with that. And I remember she would give the lessons uh, up on the third floor of that house. So I'd climb, climb up the steps and she was all the way up and with a beautiful view of the, of the uh, ocean. Yeah, so she had, a, she had a house on the cliff. Was it on the Very cliff in Etreta? All of this to introduce you to the first two works you are going to hear today. Lesser known compositions of Henriette Renier. Um, there are uh, 1927 Deux Promenades Matinales. Uh, two morning walks. So the first one, the title is Au loin, dans la verdure, la mer calme et mystérieuse, which roughly translate as far away amidst the green pastures or amidst the green, the sea, calm and mysterious. And then the second one, dans la campagne ensoleillée, la rosée scintille, in the sunny countryside, the morning dew glistens. So even if we are not in Normandy here, we are in beautiful California and there are lots of outdoors. And I just took you this morning to one of my most favorite spots, which is called Griffith Parks for a little morning hike uh, and to see the sunrise and maybe some morning dew glistening. I am not sure about that because it's a little too hot. So I wanted to share with you this bit of nature before starting uh, our journey with Henriette René.
here we are back in the Harpmobile after this beautiful hike on our way to the ocean for uh, the other promenade matinale, the other morning walk by Henriette Renier. Au loin dans la verdure, la mer calme et mystérieuse. Far away amidst the green, the sea calm and mysterious.
So these two pieces are called the morning walks, but they are not exactly a walk in the park, as you could see. And I was super happy to pick them because they are very rare. Nobody knows them. And so it was the occasion for me to display uh, works by Henriette Renier that have a very different color than the one we are used to. Uh, for example, when we see the legend, the writing, which was 1901, was much more late romantic influenced. And in these two morning walks, we have the color of Debussy and Ravel peeking through. And I think it speaks of the influence they had both on her. So in our lifetime, Renier uh, was really interested in transcribing a lot of works. That brings us to our next subject. And uh, first of all, I think she did it as a pedagogical tool for her students so that they could discover other music by other masters that were non-harpists. And the second one was maybe, I think, to broaden the repertoire. By doing this, she could bring interesting music to the audience and show the possibilities of the harp. So I picked three different transcriptions. The first one is a childhood memory for me. Uh, when I grew up, my sister was playing the piano at home and she played uh, Le Coucou by Louis-Claude Daquin. He was a French Baroque composer, so that's a Baroque piece. And when I saw there was a transcription by Henriette René, I couldn't resist the idea to present it to you. The second one is the most famous transcription, Le Rossignol, The Nightingale, based on a Russian melody by Alexander Aladiev. Uh, first, Liszt, the famous pianist, transcribed it for piano, and then René took Liszt's work and made it her own for the harp. And finally, I'm going to finish with Les Myrtilles, the blueberries. It's a transcription from a piano piece by Théodore Dubois. Uh, Théodore Dubois was a composer, French composer from the late 19th century, but he was also Henriette Renier's composition professor at the Paris Conservatoire. And I think it's a way for Renier to pay tribute to him and to also show a very challenging work, technically wise.
Hi guys and welcome to a brand new episode of a French harpist in the kitchen. So our way to honor uh, the harpist of all times by paying them tribute through food. As we are honoring the beautiful and uh, amazing Henriette Renier, we cannot go without uh, speaking of one of her favorite places in France, this region, which is called Normandy. Most of you must know Normandy because of uh, the D-Day, but also Normandy for French people is a country with beautiful uh, apple orchards and also a lot of milk production, so it's very famous for its cheese. And I read somewhere in a book, I don't remember which one, that Henriette Renier was very fond of cheese and would actually, after a morning practice, go outside and pick some cheese for lunch. Without further ado, let's start. The recipe that I picked today to honor our dear Henriette is crêpe normande aux pommes flambé au calvados, which roughly translate as apple pancakes flambé with calvados. Calvados is a strong apple liqueur from France, so it's for 21 plus only, of course. So let's get going. We are gonna start by sifting uh, two and a half cups of wheat flour. We add some uh, French fleur de sel. So if you don't have fleur de sel, of course, you can um, uh, substitute it with a kosher salt, so it's a quarter teaspoon. And after that, we are going to add so four uh, large eggs. So then to this, uh, we had uh, one and a half cup of raw milk. And to that, we are going to add another specialty from Normandy which is hard apple cider. We have two regions, big regions that produce cider in France. There is Bretagne, Brittany, that's a more a kind of a bitter cider. And then uh, Normandy, where the quality of the cider is a little more sweet. So I would use like a semi-sweet or a sweet cider for this recipe. And so why are we adding alcohol and hard cider to the batter? It's because some fermentation is gonna happen to make the batter lighter. So here we're going to add two tablespoons of Calvados. Okay. And you put it in the fridge to rest for so a minimum of four hours. Or if you can prepare it uh, the day before, the night before, then all night in the fridge, it would be ideal. See you later, guys. And yet another perfect sunset in beautiful California. I love the light here, it's really nice. This particular ambience to it. Luckily it brings me to our next subject. Um, the connection that Henriette Renier had in her life with the fantastic and literature. She was really, I think, a storyteller, inspired by um, some great tales, like the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe, and also, of course, uh, in the Legend by the Les Elfes by Le Comte de Lille. Actually, I'm going to play that for you now. And then from Walter Scott, uh, Lay on the Last Minstrel, the Danse des Lutins, of course. So for us, it's more of a dance of the pedals, if you ask me with like 200 changes with three minutes, but it's certainly worth it. Henriette Renier had this fascination for the fantastic and the bizarre. And um, I think Susan McDonald has something to share about why she loved so much to tell stories. Let's listen to her. I also have such a fascination for uh, uh, grim and fantastic stories. You know what I mean? Yes, that comes from her family, you know, because uh -huh. when they were during the war, her brothers, you know, and her, they would read aloud uh, plays. So every night there, you know, there was no television, not much yes. radio, I think. And they, that was their entertainment was doing plays, theater, yes. theater pieces among the family. 
she was very dramatic in, in her gestures in her life you know yeah very strong and very uh, passionate about things yes and i think that comes from that early history with her family so, yeah. you know reading through all these plays and they, they stage them in, in yes the, so, so because she has, she was from a big family, you know, she had four brothers and she was the only yes. girl. It's really important to underline the influence that Henriette Roni had on many very famous harpists. Marcel Granjani was debuted by her and uh, he was admitted very young at the Paris Conservatoire. But they always kept a very close relationship, even after he moved to the United States. Mildred Dilling, as Suzanne McDonald says, was also very important in bringing her American students yeah, yeah. Uh, to study with. Uh, Mildred Dilling was a key uh, person in her life uh, yes. because she brought American students to, to study with Rennie. And she was the teacher of my teachers, and my teacher was pretty old herself, so it <laughs> was amazing. And she had me play for her, for her. Miss Ludwig, her name was. She had me play for Mildred uh, some springtime of my junior year of high school. And so, uh, I took a lesson with her, and she said, oh, it was the most famous lesson she ever had, because then she said, oh, you must go study with my teacher, which is Henri Frenier. And so she got a chaperone for me, and I went by ship with a chaperone <laughs> to ship all the way from New York to Paris. So it was a big, a big adventure for me, yes. outside of the harp even. You know? And uh, I got off the, took the boat train then to to Paris. Of course. And she had arranged for me to stay in a boarding house. Okay. Because Not you were very I young. Think. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, my first visit there was I come into the courtyard, you know, of, of uh, saint Consent. Rue de Passy. And I came into her studio. Okay. There's a little foyer before her studio. Uh -huh. And um, glass doors leading into the studio. So. Okay. I went in and she was there and uh, always, always spoke French, always from the beginning, never any English at all with me. She said right away, you know, that, that she, she welcomed me and then said, do you, do you like it? Do you love the harp? And I said, oh, we even or so we. <laughs> and she said, we're going to get along very well. So, so the, yes. Miss yeah, McDonald had to go all the way from the U.S. to uh, France by boat and to this expedition for several years in a row to meet her and, and, and learn from her, from her method. And that was a, an amazing way of uh, speaking of the technique, of the flexibility of the wrist. Also, I think there is this word by Carlos Salzedo who told that she was the best harpist on earth and in heavens too. <laughs> if you thought this highly of her, it really means a lot. Anyway, I'm getting carried away. Uh, let's get back to the music now. So as promised, uh, I'm going to start with Légende and go on with the Danse des Lutins. <laughs> Thank you. 
Welcome back guys, after these two fantastic pieces. Uh, it's night time now, and I think it's also time for us to wrap things up and prepare to say goodbye. Um, so we explore the different aspects of Henriette René's inspiration, nature, literature, other composers that she admired, but I think all of this is connected by a very strong sense of faith in God. And uh, a good person to ask about that is Miss MacDonald. Uh, so this was her routine. She got up six o'clock in the morning, yes. went to church, and then in Paris, particularly, she has a desk uh, in her studio, and and uh, she would sit down at the desk then and write a devotional, a meditation after what she had heard in, in the mass in the that mass. morning. Mm. And in all of these hundreds of these little notebooks are now in a, in the library at the Brigham, Brigham Young. Ah, University in uh, Nevada. It was, but we mostly, I would say, talked harp. She did speak to me a, a, a lot about her life, but particularly her spiritual life. You know, yes, yes. I think I told you the story that she said, uh, you know, I'm a, a Roman Catholic. Yes. Mildred Billing is a, a, a Christian Scientist, and you were a Presbyterian. Yes. But she said, Dieu le connaît bien, c'est les siens. The Lord knows His own. That's it, and that's what so matters. very sweet and so very accepting. Isn't of it a fascinating you know? to yes, think I that know. every morning Henriette René would wake up, go to Mass, and then come back at her desk and write about uh, the sermon she just heard in church. A strong sense of faith like this almost got her in a convent when she was young, but she finally decided, instead of becoming a nun, to stay a musician and to share a godly gift, which was the music, with other people. She did it through her playing, through her teaching, and through her composing. And every day she was, in a way, giving tribute to her faith and to God. This all brings us to the last piece we're going to hear today, the Pièce Symphonique, written by Henriette Renier in 1907. She actually composed it after the death of a close one. And the three episodes are very much influenced by the st different steps that you find in grieving. It begins like a cry of pain, when you just learn about the, the loss of someone you loved. And then it's immediately followed by the first episode, the March Funebre, funeral march, that goes on and expresses the uh, desolation you feel after such a traumatic event. It's followed by the second episode, an appassionato. And appassionato really is, you know, when you are grieving, first you are in disbelief, and secondly you are angry. And I think there is a lot of anger in this, uh, in this appassionato, uh, a lot of revolt against God, against uh, what happened, against the facts. And this is very present in this second episode. And this is all suddenly interrupted by a beautiful phrase that uh, I'm going to play for you now. And so this little harmonix followed by chord introduce the theme of what I call transfiguration. This theme is going to change our pain into peace or into something with much more light in it. Um, and the colors uh, Henriette René uses in this part are for me very close to Wagner and especially to his opera Parsifal that is very much about uh, redemption. And uh, in the phrase that follows the transfiguration theme, we, there is strongly an influence of Wagner and Parsifal in that. After that, there is a brief moment of revolt again, and finally, uh, Henriette René surrenders to uh, her love of God and religion and accepts that there is an afterlife and that uh, all is not so dark. And so she finishes the pieces in a true expression of uh, peace and light, very strong and powerful. That's one of my favorite works by Henriette René, actually. So I wish you a good discovery of it or a rediscovery if you know it already.
without dessert, did you? So here we go. The batter has been in the fridge for a few hours. It got a little bit thicker. We are gonna add to that about two tablespoons of melted butter. So uh, we prepared our uh, crepe pan. This one has a family history. It has followed me since my years at the Paris Conservatoire. Uh, but it's a special French uh, pan for crepe because it has a very thin border. But of course, you can use a regular pan. 
for that. So we put about one tablespoon of butter in the pan and we're going to warm it up. And then we prepared a thinly sliced uh, apple. And then there is a little brown sugar here and some more butter. Butter is about to change color. And don't worry because usually the first uh, crepe is always a miss. Okay. Then immediately you can add a little brown sugar, a few slices of apple. And then comes the interesting moment, the flipping. <laughs> so that's usually for the first one. A bad surprise, but not this time. I did good. So you add a little more sugar on top. And a tiny bit of butter. Not too much. And now we are going to prepare for the last step, which is flambé. So you take some calvados. Oop, not too much. Around one or two tablespoons. Then you warm it up until it starts boiling. It's going to get a little dangerous. So you are going to want to take some distance. Okay, so now I'm going to light up the fumes like this and pour it down slowly on my ah. oh. mm. So you wait until the fire gets out and then you are just gonna try to fold your crepe which can be a little tricky like this Et voila! Alors of course it's um, always a little better with a little uh, whipped cream, if you can, from Normandy. So that's for Henriette Renier. Une crêpe normande aux pommes flambée au calvado. Bon appétit, guys! Hey, guys! After such a day playing such difficult music, I definitely need a good night's sleep. So, uh, goodbye to all of you. Thank you for listening. And uh, a big thank you to Lion and Healy for their support and trust. To Suzanne McDonald for accepting to answer my question and share a personal experience with Henriette Renier. And to my husband for his support and love. And voila, I wish you a good night. Bonne nuit, and see you soon. Ciao.